Hello, and welcome to JNO Live. I'm Seth Truger, Digital Media Editor at Gemma Network Open. Of course, if you're following along live, send us your questions on Twitter at Gemma Network Open or in the comment box on Facebook or YouTube. Today, we are going to be talking about changes in the number of U.S. patients with newly identified cancer before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've got first author, Dr. Harvey Kaufman with us. Welcome, Dr. Kaufman. Thank you, Seth. Great. Well, really glad you could join us. This is, um, you know, unfortunately, another informative paper about the COVID pandemic. So let's, let's start off by uh, just telling us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and why you did the study. Sure. So um, I'm Harvey Coffin, Senior Medical Director, Medical Informatics at Quest Diagnostics. I've been at Quest Diagnostics for 28 years, and I'm uh, board certified in, in atomic clinical pathology and chemical pathology. Great. So what was the motivation between doing this study? So Quest Diagnostics has a lot of data. We're the largest uh, provider of clinical laboratory testing in the United States. And we looked at our data in lots of different ways, but the one that sort of really struck a chord was to see the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on cancer. Uh, cancer still strikes a that discordant chord uh, in the hearts of people. And so it has you know, more meaning than uh, many other uh, health conditions. Yep, absolutely. And you know, uh, you know, one of the big, cha you know, problems I guess with the pandemic was uh, with with efforts like people staying at home to flatten the curve, um, uh, with a lot of medical places shutting down to reduce, uh, you know, contacts with potentially sick people to to both flatten the curve and to do things that conserve PPE. That meant a lot of people forgoing things like preventative care or diagnostic non-emergent care. Um, so tell us what you did in the study and what you found. Sure. So. We went ahead and looked at a baseline period of 60 weeks, the 60 weeks ending February 29th of 2020, and compared that to the weekly counts of patients newly identified with cancer in our database by based on ICD-10 codes. And we took out anyone who was prior, previously diagnosed. So we had a group of cohort of people who were newly identified who had any type of testing whether it was a CBC or basic comprehensive medical ball panel or any test. And sure enough, uh, as things uh, changed uh, during the pandemic with restrictions and travel and uh, routine care sort of coming to a halt, um, the number of people newly identified with diabetes dropped precipitously, uh, it was 46% in that first seven week period. Mm -hmm. Right, and then looking, uh, so, sorry, I'm sorry, I just lost yeah. it here. So if we look at the figure here, um, you can see, you know, the main thing that's going on is there's, you've got the different cancers listed and what the average weekly diagnostic rates are and the the big, um, you know, the tallest, the tallest Navy column is the highest, is the um, baseline period. You said it was about 60 weeks before uh, right. the COVID pandemic and then it's week by week, uh, uh, through March and most of April in 2020, and you can see the numbers just totally drop. Yep. Yeah. And, and, the, and the good news, uh, there is good news, is that as we looked in uh, particularly May, June, and July, there's been a good bounce back, uh, particularly in the Northeast and large parts of the country. Uh, we're seeing uh, somewhat of a pullback in areas that are being hit hard now, particularly Florida and Texas, California. Um, but there's been a nice bounce back. But Despite that bounce back, um, there are a group of people who missed their colonoscopy and their mammogram and their yeah. low dose CT and their routine visits. And those patients, uh, we've got to do something to, to bring them back. And that's this is, it's really a call to action. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's the kind of thing I think I think a lot of us in healthcare recognizes that uh, we're we're basically operating at or near capacity most of the time in normal times. So when there's just a setback like this, you know, it's already you know weeks or months out to get something like a screening colonoscopy scheduled uh, for most people, even with pretty good insurance. Um, so is there going to be a catch up period where basically we're going to get back? You know, let's say things normalize tomorrow, would we be able to catch up to where we were before? Um, we, that's where we need some planning to sort of increase the capacity, whether it's uh, working on weekends or working on uh, after hours, but expand the hours where some of the resources can best be applied to bring these people back. And the other aspect is if there is a surge, new surge uh, that coincides with the influenza uh, season, 
uh, you know, it becomes more urgent to sort of bring people in now when we have some window of opportunity. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. I think, you know, comparing to some of the prior pandemics, like, uh, say, um, the 1918 flu pandemic, you know, it certainly looked like things were mostly big waves. So maybe trying to hit a trough. But unfortunately, I think things have been so uh, heterogeneous across the country that there aren't really troughs. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, just one yeah. curve yep. so far. Yeah. Um, we do have a couple people watching. We've got uh, Earth Angel, Ying Orange, Vicky Roy, and Kathy H. who are who are uh, joining us. So welcome. We're talking about um, the drop in newly identified cancers uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, so I guess uh, on the flip side, you know, I, I'm certainly not a cancer epidemiologist. Uh, I, I don't do this sort of thing. I'm not an oncologist either, uh -huh. uh, by far. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but, you know, I hear a lot about things like, you know, lead time bias or uh, with with diagnosis that, you know, a lot of these cancers might be caught, uh, you know, say a few months later and might be it might be fine at that point. Um, if the screening is still able to happen, are we going to be really behind the eight ball here or is this the kind of thing we can make up for? So, Seth, for most people, it, it probably won't make any difference. In fact, it won't make a difference for the vast majority of people. But for some people, it will. Mm -hmm. um, so let me use an analogy of. Um, dental care. Um, I go to the dentist every six months, and over the six-month um, interval, my plaque keeps building up, and at some point, you know, I go to the dentist, they clean my teeth, and I'm good to go. Um, and that's before I hopefully get any gum disease or any fillings and such. But if I go seven months or eight months or nine months, 10 months or a year, you know, the, the plaque is building up and it's and some percentage of people will develop the gum disease or the fillings that mm -hmm. would have been caught if they had gone at six months mm -hmm. and so the same thing is whole it holds true for cancer that there's cancer doesn't take a pause and some people will develop a more advanced stage of cancer um, and some people will likely die as a consequence so there was an estimate saying that there's about 34,000 additional deaths that might be expected. Um, and to put that in some context, uh, we have about 600,000 deaths a year due to cancer. So 34,000 between five and 6%. Um, so it is likely to have some impact uh, that's going to hurt a number of people. Yep, absolutely. And um, I think that's one of those things where, and I, I've said this here before a number of times, but uh, you know, it's easy to look at things like the overall death rate for the pandemic, but there's so many different ways in which people are impacted. Um, you know, there's the people who are intubated, people who are you know, just in the hospital for weeks, people end up with long-term symptoms, um, and then these other things that aren't even directly related to the pandemic, you know, the the health costs, the economic costs, and things like that. And I just think it's it's so easy to uh, I think ignore the rest of that iceberg when you just talk yeah. about things. Yeah. And, and, and just like with the uh, heterogeneity, we, you know, we briefly touched on before, uh, you know, one of the challenges when when the, this kind of second wave in the U.S. was increasing was that New York was doing so much better for so long that it was kind of dwarfing the numbers of the increases in other states. Um, so, you know, looking at it with, uh, I think this la layer of granularity is important um, and that, you know, the, the impacts are just, I think, so disparate across the board. Yeah. Yeah. So as much as we did focus on cancer, um, we also recognize that uh, it's a proxy for everything in healthcare, whether it's the dental care that I was talking about earlier or um, getting screened for um, lipids or for diabetes, chronic kidney disease, uh, whatever it may be, uh, all of healthcare uh, was temporarily frozen uh, as we focused on the critical needs uh, of patients with COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and going to welcome Dina USA, who's joined us as well. Um, one thing I like, despite your, uh, you know, the 600 word limit in the letter here is your, your <laughs> intro, uh, called out a lot of things, you know, I'm an emergency doc. So, so it, you know, jumped out to me the things like the drop in, in STEMIs, uh, and other life threatening conditions we've seen, e even with, you know, the data we have that suggests COVID it increases rates of stroke. The ED visits for stroke seem to be down. ED visits overall in pandemic areas are down like 40 to 60%. Um, it's just everything is so different. Uh, people just aren't able to get a lot of care that they need, unfortunately. And, you know, this cancer care is one big piece of it. Yes. Yeah, well, go ahead. 
Yeah, no, we've looked at other a aspects as well. So things like uh, you know uh, patterns of drug uh, misuse have changed uh, to the worse, uh, and there's an increase in drug deaths. There's an increase uh, in homicides and other causes of uh, stress as people have uh, been locked down and um, had to adjust or not adjust so well uh, to the change. Yep. Yeah. Well, on that positive note, I think that, uh, <laughs> that ends the session today. Um, again, this is really important stuff. I think really uh, helping fully describe the impact of the pandemic is important. And, uh, you know, delayed diagnosis of cancer is is unfortunately, uh, ev even if it's a, a relatively small percentage of the people who are ultimately affected in a meaningful way, it's, it's still an important burden that, that a lot of people have to bear. Um, so, thank you, Seth. Yes. Yeah, so thank you for this work and thank you for joining us. Um, of course, this paper and the rest of the JNO papers are available at jamanetworkopen.com, where everything's free and open access. We've got new papers coming out every weekday at 10 a.m. Uh, we are going to skip next week's JNO Live. So, of course, uh, please join us the following week, which I believe, if my math is correct, is August 24th, uh, Tuesday at 3 p.m. Central Time. Oh, wait, before we go, there is a question. What is the most common kind of cancer that is being newly diagnosed? And if I can see from your data, it looks like it's still breast cancer. Is that correct? Of the six that we looked at, uh, yes. Yep. Okay. Great. And that what, breast cancer, and that had a fifty-two percent drop in in weekly diagnosis. If I got the numbers right, is that correct? At at, at the trough, and uh, yep. hopefully we're seeing some bounce back since then. Yep. All right. So glimmers of hope, and hopefully the beginnings of a return to normalcy. So thank you again for joining us, <laughs> and uh, take care. Stay safe. You too.